Chapter 10 Among the Magicians and Holy Men Space and time, those defiant enemies of man, hurry this pen again. My feet must once more take giant strides on this eastward trek, while my pen sets down a few salient things that are worth a written memorial. It is true that the fakir of a few tricks, the magician of the streets, holds for me, as for everyone else, a natural interest. Yet mine is only a fleeting interest, for he can throw little light on the greatest mysteries of human life, which are alone worthy of a man's deepest thought. Still his presence is a diversion, and I turn aside on occasions to inquire after him. I want to picture a few of the types who come into the orbit of my wandering, to point my pen at widely differing men. One of them looms up in memory though he is but an insignificant trickster, whom I met at Rajamundri, a quiet town in the northeastern part of Madras Presidency. An aimless stroll takes me through a place where my shoes sink into the soft sand which covers the ground. Eventually I arrive at a narrow street which leads to a bazaar. As I walk along in the sultry air, old men squat in open doorways, children play amid the dirt, and a stark naked youngster dives out of a house, only to disappear again on catching sight of the stranger. In the long, bustling bazaar itself, elderly merchants sit in their little shops and stroke their beards expectantly, while I pass. The sellers of food and grain squat beside their open booths, while an army of flies is busy attacking their wares. In course of time, I come to the somewhat gaudy structure of a temple where a little group of men and women stirs out of the dust at my approach. The leprous, the crippled, and the destitute make their rendezvous near the temples and the stations of most Indian cities, that they may gather alms of the pious and the strangers. Worshippers walk noiselessly into the building, their bare feet treading the dust on the stones. Shall I, too, wander into the building and watch the ministrations of the priests I debate the question, and decide in the negative. I proceed on my protracted ramble until I observe a youth striding along before me. He is dressed in a European shirt, worn as is the custom, back to front, and a flowing waistband while his right arm clasps a bundle of cloth-bound books. When I overtake him, he instinctively turns his head. Our eyes meet, and our acquaintance begins. The exigencies of my profession have taught me to serve the conventions whenever one can, but dispense with them, whenever they stand between one and an objective. I like travel, but usually in an unconventional way. Hence my Indian wanderings will hardly be a model for the cook's tourist or unbohemian traveler. The youth proves to be a student at a large local college, and he possesses an air of general intelligence which is quite attractive. Moreover, he seems to have a care for the ancient culture of his land, and when I tell him of my interest in the subject, his delight knows no bounds. I discover, too, that he has not yet succumbed to the hysteria for politics which has attacked most of the young students in the towns. Though India is now in the throes of a long turmoil, which Gandhi has aroused into being in his efforts to disturb the relations between white rulers and brown rule, Half an hour later, he is guiding me to an open space where a little crowd is gathered in an expectant mood. There is a man in the center who is bawling something at the top of his voice. The youth informs me that this loud declaration consists mainly of a list of wonderful yogic powers which the man claims to possess. The self-proclaimed yogi is powerfully built. He has an elongated head, thick-set shoulders, and an abdomen which has begun to bulge through the piece of cotton cloth wrapped around his loins, which constitutes part of his dress. For the rest, he wears a long, loose white robe. I feel that there is a little too much bravado about the man, but when he offers to perform the mango tree feat, if sufficient financial inducement is forthcoming, I join with a few others in throwing some coins at his feet. He begins by placing a capacious earthenware pot in front of him, and then proceeds to squat on the ground. The pot is filled with reddish-brown earth. 
he shows us a little mango stone and plants it in the earth. After that, he produces a large cloth out of his traveling bag and spreads it over the pot, his folded knees and his thighs. For several minutes, we are treated to some mystic incantations, which the yogi chants in a monotonous voice, and then he withdraws the cloth. The first bud of a mango plant peeps its head above the earth. Once again, he covers both pot and legs, picks up a reed pipe, and emits a weird noise which is presumably to be taken for music. After some more minutes, he takes up the cloth to show that the little plant has grown a few inches higher. This procedure of covering and uncovering, with due intervals of pipe music, is repeated until a small mango bush has emerged from the earth. It is about nine or ten inches high, hardly a tree, but nevertheless a small yellowish gold mango fruit hangs from the top of the plant. All this tree has sprung from the seed which you saw be bury in the earth, announces the yogi triumphantly. My mental constitution does not permit me to accept his statement too readily. I feel somehow that the feat was a piece of mere jugglery. The young man delivers his opinion. Sahib, the man is a yogi. Such men can do wonderful things. But I am not satisfied. Trying to comprehend the mystery, I decide that the man is more likely a member of the masculine and devout fraternity. Yet how can one be certain about the matter? The yogi closes his bag and continues to crouch on his hams while watching the crowd slowly disperse. An idea comes suddenly. When we are alone, I approach the yogi, pull out a five-rupee note, and say to the student, Tell him that he can have this money if he will show me how the thing is done. The youth obediently translates my request. The man makes a show of refusal, but I catch the gleam of desire in his eyes. Offer him seven rupees then. Still the crouching man scorns my attempt to negotiate. Very well, tell him that we bid him farewell. We proceed to walk away, though I purposely take slow steps. Within a few seconds, the yogi shouts and recalls us. If the sahib will give one hundred rupees, the yogi promises to tell all. No, seven, or he can keep his secret. Come. Once again, we move away. Soon there is another shout. We return. The yogi says he will accept the seven rupees, and the explanation duly comes forth. The man opens his traveling bag and produces the paraphernalia with which his mystifying feat has been performed. It consists of a mango stone in bud and three slips of mango plant, each longer than the previous one. He compresses the shortest slip into a mussel shell. The plant bends round into this cramping position. The shell is closed and buried in the earth. To produce the first bud, the man has only to dig his fingers into the earth and remove the lid of the shell when the plant will once more stand erect. The longer slips of plant are hidden within his cotton waist wrap. During the intervals of waiting, chanting, and music making, he raises the cloth cover once or twice to see how the growth is proceeding, without, however, permitting anyone else to do the same. Under cover of these movements, he deftly takes a longer slip from his waistcloth, plants it in the earth, removes the shorter plant, and replaces it in his dress. Thus the illusion of a growing plant is created. I walk away a little wiser, tis true, but I begin to wonder whether my last illusions about these yogis will fall from me like brown's leaves rustled off the trees in autumn. I then remember the warning given me by Brahma the yogi of the Adyar River, that fakirs of a low order and pseudo-yogis give performances in the streets that are nothing but conjuring feats. Such men can bring the name of yogi into discredit with the younger people and educated classes, he has informed me. This man who makes mangoes grow in less than half an hour is no real yogi. He is a pretender. Nevertheless, the fakirs who practice a true magic do exist. One comes to me during a halt at Burhampur, where I go to his second puri. In this town of Burhampur, where the old customs and dusty ways of Hindu life refuse to be dislodged, I have taken temporary quarters in a rest house, which possesses a widely roofed veranda. 
One broiling afternoon I seek refuge from the stifling heat in the pleasant shade of this veranda. From my long chair I watch the play of sunshine upon the luxuriant foliage of some tropical plants in the garden. There comes the almost silent patter of naked feet, and a rather wild-looking man, carrying a small bamboo basket, approaches the compound gate. He has long, black, tangled locks, and I notice that his eyes are a little bloodshot. He comes closer, deposits his basket in the dust, and momentarily raises his hands to cover his face as a salute. He addresses me in a mixture of vernacular and faintly recognizable English. I fancy that the vernacular is Telugu, though I am not sure. The accent of his English is so execrable that I am unable to grasp the meaning of more than three or four words. I retaliate by trying some sentences in English on him, but his command of the language is totally insufficient to enable him to understand me. My command of Telugu, however, is even more insufficient to enable me to understand him. We both discover this fact after we have attempted utterances, which are nothing more than long strings of sound to the other. Finally, he attempts to devise a language of gesture and facial expression until I gather that he has something of importance in the basket to show me. I dive into the bungalow and call for the servant who knows a sprinkling of English, just about enough to sprinkle some intelligibility upon his own vernacular verbosity. I bid him do what he can to translate. He wishes to show you Fakir's magic, master. Excellent. Let him show it then. How much money does he want? He says master can give what he pleases. Go ahead. The Fakir's unkempt appearance and unknown origin alternately intrigue and repel me. It is difficult to fathom the expression on this man's countenance. There is something almost sinister about it yet I do not feel the presence of evil. What I sense around him is an aura of strange forces, unfamiliar powers. He makes no attempt to mount the veranda steps, but squats down under a banyan tree, whose long, rambling branches form a low canopy which trails over his head and sinks to the ground. Out of the bamboo basket he draws forth a venomous-looking scorpion, which he holds by means of a pair of rudely made wooden pincers. The unpleasant-looking insect tries to run away. Immediately the fakir draws a circle around it in the dust, using his index finger. Thereafter it continues to run round and round. Each time it reaches the circle it hesitates, as though confronting some visible barrier, and then goes off in another direction. I watch the thing closely in that hard, brilliant, tropical light. After two or three minutes of this peculiar exhibition, I raise my hand in a gesture of satisfaction, and the fakir places the scorpion in his basket, from which he next draws out two sharp, thin-pointed iron skewers. He closes his somewhat terrifying reddened eyes, and seems to wait for an appropriate moment to perform his next piece of magic. At length he opens his optical organs, takes one of the skewers, and puts it into his mouth, point foremost. He forces it through his cheek until most of its length protrudes strangely outside his face. As if not satisfied with this slightly gruesome feat, he repeats it by forcing the second skewer through his other cheek. Mingled sensations of repulsion and wonder flow through me. When he imagines that I have seen enough, he withdraws each of the skewers in turn and proffers a salute. I descend the veranda steps and closely examine his face. Beyond a few insignificant drops of blood and two tiny holes in the skin, both wounds are hardly noticeable. The man makes a gesture to bid me occupy my chair again. When I am once more reclining on the veranda, he quietly composes himself for two or three minutes as though in further preparation for some striking feat. Calmly with the detachment with which one might pull a button from his jacket, the fakir's right hand ascends to his eyes seizes the right eyeball and gradually pulls it out of its socket. I start back, astonished. There is a few seconds interval and he draws the organ a little further out, so that it hangs loosely on his cheek, suspended by protruding muscles and veins. A feeling of nausea overwhelms me at the ghastly sight. I remain uneasy, 
until he replaces the dislodged eyeball in its socket. I have had enough of his magic and reward him with some silver rupees. Half-heartedly, I ask the servant to inquire if the man is willing to explain how he performs these anatomical horrors. Promise no tell, master. Father teach son only. Only family now. His unwillingness does not disturb me. After all, it is a matter more for the investigation of surgeons and doctors than for errant writers. The fakir covers his face with his hands in a parting salute, retreats through the gates of the compound, and soon disappears down the dusty road. The quiet ripple of the waves at Puri comes to my ears. It is pleasant to catch the tang of a faint breeze which blows in from the Bay of Bengal. I walk upon a deserted part of the shore, where yellowish-white sand stretches away in a broad expanse, and where one sees the horizon to the hot, shimmering haze which fills the air. The sea is like a liquid sapphire. My watch glitters in the glaring sunlight as I draw it out of a pocket. Retracing my steps to the town, I walk right into an inexplicable performance which is destined to provide me with a standing puzzle. I discover a gaudily dressed man surrounded by a mixed crowd. His turban and pajama trousers reveal him as a Mohammedan. I reflect on the anachronism that a Mohammedan should be so prominent in a town which is so pronouncedly Hindu. The man piques my curiosity and arouses my interest. He has a little tame monkey which is quaintly dressed in colored clothes. He puts it through its paces and each time it unerringly obeys the commands of its master with an intelligence which is almost human. Espying me, the man says something to the creature which straightway hops through the crowd and accosts me with a plaintive cry. It then removes its hat and holds it out before me as though begging for bakshish. I throw in a four on a piece. The monkey politely bows its head, makes a sort of curtsy, and then returns to its master. Its next performance is to execute an amazing dance in perfect time to the music pressed out of an old accordion by the man. It possesses an artistic grace and exquisite sense of rhythm worthy of a better stage. When the show comes to an end, the man addresses a few words in Urdu to his assistant, a young Mohammedan, who approaches me and asks me to enter a tent which stands at the rear, as his master has something special to show me. While the youth remains outside to keep back the press of people, I enter the tent with the gaudily dressed man. I discover inside that the structure is really a cloth partition flung around four upright posts, and that it is quite roofless. One can see, therefore, almost as well inside as out. A plain, light wooden table occupies the center. The man opens a linen wrap and takes out several tiny dowels, each about two inches high. The heads are made of colored wax and the legs of stiff straw shod with flat iron buttons. The man then places the tiny figures on the table so that each one stands quite erect upon its iron buttons. He withdraws about a yard from the table and begins to issue commands in Urdu. Within a minute or two, the Daos commence to sit around the table and then to dance. He waves his short wand, much as an orchestra conductor wields his baton to beat time, and the colored little figures dance away in perfect rhythm with his flourishes. They move all over the table's surface, but carefully avoid falling over the edge. I see this amazing display in full daylight at about four o'clock in the afternoon. Suspecting some trick, I moved near the table and examine it thoroughly, even moving my arms about the figures and below the table in quest of strands of thread, but I can find nothing untoward. Is the man not a mere conjurer, but a fakir of some kind? He then proceeds to indicate by means of signs and words that I should point out different parts of the table. I do so, and on each occasion, the dows mass themselves together and dance in a body towards the precise direction which I indicate. Lastly, he shows me a rupee piece and utters something which I intuitively divine as a request to produce such a coin. I take one out of my pocket and place it on the table. Almost immediately, the silver coin commences to dance across the surface towards the fakir. When it reaches the farther edge of the table, it falls off and rolls over to his feet where it suddenly stops. 
The man picks it up and keeps it, making some courtly solemns in his acknowledgement. Am I witnessing some remarkable piece of conjuring or a feat of real yogi magic? My doubts must clearly be writing themselves upon my face. For the fakir calls in his young assistant. The latter asks me whether I wish to see some more of his master's power. I reply in the affirmative, whereupon he hands the old accordion to the fakir and then requests me to place my ring on the table. I take the ring off my finger and obey him. It is the same ring which Brahma, the anchorite of the Adyar River, presented me as a farewell gift. I watch its golden claws and greenish stone. The while the fakir withdraws a few paces away and issues command after command in Urdu. At each word, the ring rises into the air and falls again. The man makes an appropriate gesture with his right hand, synchronously with his commands. His left hand still holds the accordion. Now he begins to play the instrument, and before my astounded gaze, the ring starts to dance upon the table in harmony with the music. The man has not approached it, has not even touched it. I do not know what to make of this remarkable performance. How is it possible to transform so mysterious a piece of inanimate matter and to make it into an object that responds to verbal commands? When the assistant returns my ring, I examine it closely but can find no trace of any mark. Once again the fakir unwraps his cotton package. This time he draws out a rusty, flat iron bar. It is about two and a half inches long and a half inch in width. He is about to place it on the table when I intervene and request the assistant to let me examine it. There is no objection and I carefully scrutinize it. There are no threads attached to it. I return it and look over the table but find nothing suspicious. The bar rests on the tabletop. The fakir vigorously rubs the palms of his hands together for about one minute. Then he bends his trunk slightly forward and holds his hands a few inches above the iron bar. I watch him attentively. He begins to draw his hands slowly backward, still pointing his fingers towards the bar. When my startled eyes see the rusty object follow him, it moves over the tabletop of its own accord parallel to the fakir's backward movement. The distance between the man's fingers and the bar is about five inches. When his hands hover above the table's edge, the bar likewise rests there. Once again, I ask to be allowed to examine it. Permission is readily granted. I pick it up immediately but find nothing wrong. It is just a scrap of old iron. The fakir repeats the same feat with a small, steel-handled knife. I reward him liberally for these unusual displays and then endeavor to obtain some explanation of them. The fakir vouchsafes the information that it is usually essential for the object to be made of or to contain iron because iron possesses a peculiar psychic quality. Now he has so perfected himself in this art that he can perform the same feat with objects made of gold. I seek in mind for a solution of his secret. Almost at once it occurs to me that a long, thin hair, looped at one end, could catch the bar in its loop and yet remain practically invisible. And then I remember my dancing ring, the fact that the fakir's both hands were occupied with the accordion, and that he stood several paces away. Neither can the assistant be accused of complicity, for he stood outside the tent during the movements of the dolls. However, in order to test the matter still further, I praise the man as being a clever conjurer and juggler. His brow darkens and he vehemently denies being one. What are you then? I press home my inquiry. I am a true fakir, he answers proudly through the assistant. A practicer of the art of... I am unable to catch the last word, which is some Urdu name. I tell him of my interest in these things. Yes, I observed that even before you reached the crowd, he replies disconcertingly. That is why I invited you to this tent. Indeed, yes, do not imagine that I am collecting money through greed. It is because I need a certain sum to build a mausoleum for my late master. I have set my heart upon this work and I shall not rest until it is built. I beg him to tell me a little more about his life. Very reluctantly, he yields to the request. When I was a boy of thirteen, I was occupied in taking care of a herd of goats for my father. 
One day there came to a village a lean ascetic whose thinness was almost terrifying. The bone seemed to be sticking up out of his skin. He asked for a night's food and shelter, which was readily given him by my father, who always treated holy men with respect and regard. However, instead of staying for a single night, his stay extended for more than a year. Such was the liking which our family formed for him that my father continually pressed him to remain and enjoy our hospitality. He was a wonderful man, and we early discovered that he possessed strange powers. One evening, as we sat at our simple meal of rice and vegetables, he looked at me several times very closely, and I wondered why. The following morning, he came to the place where I was tending the goats and sat down by my side. My child, he said, would you like to become a fakir? I did not have a very clear idea what that sort of life was like, but its freedom and strangeness appealed greatly to me, so I told him that I would be glad to become one. He spoke to my parents and said that he would return when I was three years older, and then he would take me away with him. Strangely enough, both my parents died during that time so that when he came, I was quite free to accompany him. Thereafter, we roamed the land, going from village to village. I as his disciple, he as my master. All the marvels which you have seen today are really his, for he taught me how to do them. Is it possible to learn these things easily? I ask, the fakir laughs, only by many years of hard practices can a man master such things. Somehow I feel that his story rings true. He seems a pleasant, sincere sort of man. Though I am skeptical by temperament, yet I keep my skepticism on a leash. As I stagger out of the tent, uncertain whether I have lived through an extraordinary dream, the present breeze revives me. I hear it stir a row of graceful coconut trees which shadow a distant compound. The farther I walk away, the more incredible those feats appear to me. I would like to suspect some trick on the fakir's part, yet I feel that his character is more honest than not. But how can one explain this amazing art of moving material objects without visible contact? I do not understand how anyone can alter natural laws at his mere whim. Perhaps we do not know as much about the nature of things as we think we do. Puri is one of the sacred cities of India. Monasteries and temples have found a home here since antiquity. Pilgrims pour into the town during certain years of festival and help to pull the gigantic car of Joggernaut on its two-mile journey. I take the opportunity to study the holy men who pass through the place and, in the result, have to modify my earlier unfavorable impressions. One wandering holy man, who speaks broken but understandable English, proves to be quite a fine character when I get into closer acquaintance with him. He is on the right side of forty and wears a thin necklace of berries around his throat. He tells me that he roams from shrine to shrine upon pilgrimage and from monastery to monastery, wearing only a single robe and begging his food. His ambition is to visit the chief sacred places of the East and South. I help him with a little alms. In return, he shows me a small book printed in Tamil. It is so yellow-stained and weather-worn as to appear nearly a century old. It contains several quaint woodcuts. Slowly and carefully, he cuts out two of the pictures and presents them to me. My encounter with the literary sadhu, as I name him, is more amusing. It happens one morning when I sit upon the sands, reading the rose-scented pages of Omar Khayyam. The Rubdiyat is a poem which always fascinates me, but since the day when a young Persian writer initiated me into its deeper meaning, I find a twofold pleasure in drinking the wine of its quatrains. This delight which the poem holds for me accounts, perhaps, for the fact that I am so absorbed in it as not to notice the figure which walks across the sands towards me. It is only when raising my eyes from the printed pages at last that I see this unexpected visitor squatting on folded legs beside me. He wears a holy man's yellow robe, and on the ground he has placed a walking staff and a small linen bundle. I notice the edges of some books peeping out of the latter. Pardon me, sir, says the man in excellent English as he introduces himself, but I too am a student of your literature. He begins to untie the knot of his linen bundle. Please do not be offended, sir. I could not resist talking to you. Offended? Not at all. I smile back at him. You are a tourist? 
hardly that. But you have not lived long in our country, he persists. I make a nodding assent. He unrolls the bundle and displays three cloth-bound books with worn-looking covers and tattered corners, some paper-wrapped pamphlets, and some writing paper. Observe, sir, here I have essays by Lord Macaulay. A wonderful literary style, sir, a great intellect. But what a materialist! So I have stumbled across a budding literary critic, I reflect. This book is A Tale of Two Cities by Mr. Charles Dickens. What sentiment, what tear-bringing pathos, sir. After that, the holy man quickly wraps his treasures together and turns to address me once more. If it is not too impertinent, may I inquire the title of the book you are reading, sir? I am reading a book by Kayam. Mr. Kayam? I have not heard of him. Is he one of your novelists? I laugh at the question. No, a poet. There is an interval of silence. You are very inquisitive, I remark. Is it alms that you want? I do not come for money, sir, he answers slowly. What I really want and what I hope for is that you will present me with the book. I am so fond of reading, you see. Yes, you shall have a book. When I return to the bungalow, you may accompany me, and I shall find something slow and early Victorian that will be sure to please you. My deep gratitude, sir. Wait a moment. Before I give you the present, I want you to tell me something. What is the third book in your bundle? Ah, sir, it is a most uninteresting volume. Quite possibly, but I would like to know its title. It is almost unworthy of mention, sir. Do you still want the book I have promised you? The other man becomes a little panic-stricken. I do indeed, sir. I must tell you, since you force me, it is called Mammonism and Materialism, a study of the West by a Hindu critic. I pretend to look shocked. Oh, so that is the kind of literature you study. It was given to me by a merchant in the town. He excuses himself in a weak, apologetic manner. Let me see it, then. I run my eyes over the chapter headings of his tattered volume and read a page here and there. It is written in declamatory style by some Bengali badu and published in Calcutta, probably at its author's expense. On the strength of the two degrees tacked on to the end of his name, but without any first-hand acquaintance with this subject, the writer luridly pictures Europe and America as a kind of new inferno, full of suffering and gloom, and people by tortured working classes and cyberetic plutocrats engaged in debased pleasures. I return the book without comment. The holy man hastily puts it away and produces one of his pamphlets. This contains a short biography of an Indian saint, but it is printed in Bengali, he informs me. Now tell me, sir, do you agree with the writer of Mammonism? I ask. Just a little, sir, just a little. It is my ambition to travel to the West one day, then I shall see for myself. And what will you do there? I shall deliver lectures to transform the darkness of people's minds into light. I would like to follow in the footsteps of our great Swami Vivekananda, who gave such captivating orations in the great cities of your land. Alas, that he died so young. What a golden tongue died with him. Well, you are a strange kind of holy man, I remark. He raises a forefinger to the side of his nose and reprise with a sapient air. The supreme playwright has set the stage. What are we but actors who make our entrances and exits, as your world-renowned Shakespeare says? I come now to the realization that India's holy men are an extremely mixed lot. Many are good, inoffensive people for the most part, even though they seem anemic from the angle of power or wisdom. Others are either failures in worldly life or just men looking for an easy living. One of these men approaches me and begs for bakshish. His matted hair, ass-smeared body, and rascally face give him a repulsive appearance. I decide to resist his importunities, if only to study the result. Resistance merely increases his persistence. When finally he tries a new tack by offering to sell me his bead rosary, to which dirty-looking object he attaches reverential importance, if I am to judge by the exorbitant price he demands, I bid him be gone. Less common are those foolish ascetics who publicly display their efforts at self-torture. The man who holds an arm aloft in the air until his nails are half a yard long may be matched by the man who stands on one leg for years. 
what either hopes to gain from these unattractive exhibitions, aside from the few annas he may collect in the begging bowl which rest at his side, it is not easy to determine. A few seem to practice a sinister sorcery quite openly. They are the voodoo men of India and work mainly in the villages. For a small fee they will injure your enemy, dispose of an unfavored wife, or clear the path of your ambition by striking your rival down with mysterious sickness. One hears dark and astonishing tales concerning these black magicians, yet they too rejoice in the name of yogi or fakir. Remains a cultured remnant of holy men who condemn themselves to long years of distracted search, to periods of painful self-denial, and to ostracism from the conventional world of organized society because they have gone forth in search of truth. They possess an instinct which plainly says, whether rightly or wrongly, that to attain to truth it is to attain to lasting happiness. We may question the Indian's stereotyped, religious, and world-renouncing way of conducting this search, but the urge which sends him forth is less open to question. The average man in the West has no time for such a quest. He possesses a good excuse for accepting the prevailing mood of indifference, because he knows that if he errs, then he errs in company with a whole continent. For this skeptical age treats the search after truth as a trifle, while spending its own energy upon the serious pursuit of what our best moments reveal as trifles. Somehow it never occurs to us that the few whose lives are spent in the passionate quest of life's real meaning are more likely to form correct opinions on the problems of the passing hour than those who spend their energies upon a dozen different interests and have given barely a single thought to the discovery of truth. A Westerner once came down into the Punjab plains on a mission other than mine, but some folk he encountered there caused him to strike off on an unexpected tangent until he came dangerously near to forgetting his primal purpose. Alexander the Great, was looking for a vaster land than his own to put under his scepter. He came as a soldier, but it seemed that he might finish as a philosopher. I often speculate about the thoughts which ran through Alexander's brain as he drove his chariot homeward across icy mountains and parched deserts. It is not difficult to perceive that the Macedonian king, who fell under the spell of the sages and yogis he encountered and spent days at a time eagerly questioning them, and warmly discussing their philosophy, needed only a few more years' sojourn in their midst to startle the West with new departures in policy. The holy men of today still contain some among their ranks who do much to keep alive what there is of idealism and spirituality in the country. That the undesirable are in the majority is possible. If so, it is the inevitable result of time's degenerating activity but it need not blind us to the presence of the saving remnant who shine out all the more. One meets such a bewildering variety that it does not seem advisable to affix a label, either of praise or blame, upon the whole race. I understand the attitude of those hot-headed students of the towns who assure me that the extermination of these parasitic holy men will constitute a great blessing on India. I equally understand those milder spirits who, older in years and residents of quieter towns, inform me that if Indian society can no longer provide for its holy men, then it is doomed. The problem is important to India in other directions, for economic distress is compelling certain revaluations. The holy man fulfills no useful economic function in the country. Swarms of ignorant and untaught persons wander through the villages and attend the periodic religious fairs in certain cities. They become bogeymen to the children, and impertinent, importunate beggars to the adults. They are a burden to society, for they have nothing to give in return for that which they receive. Yet there exist also real noble men, who have thrown up good positions or given away their property in order to go forth and find God. Wherever they go, they endeavor to exalt those with whom they come in contact. If character counts, then their efforts to uplift themselves and others is surely worth the bit of bread or plate of rice they receive. One can only say in conclusion that one must strip the spiritual skin off a man 
whether he be vain humbug or saintly wonder, if his real worth is to be rightly estimated, the black mantilla of night descends upon the ample shoulders of this earth, the while I wander through the narrow, overcrowded lanes in old Calcutta. My mind is still haunted by a gruesome sight of the morning. Our train puffs into Howrah Station bearing a ghastly cargo on its cowcatcher. The line runs for many miles through a dangerous jungle, where princely panthers roam freely. During the night, our engine hits a beast, kills it instantly, and carries the broken body into the station. The panther's torn, jagged flesh is not easily dislodged from the iron frame. But in the onward-rushing train I have picked up another thread of guidance in this quest. Like most mainline trains in India, it is packed to the point of fullness. The compartment in which I have been fortunate enough to find a berth, for all trains carry sleeping berths except in the lowest class, contains a mixed crew. They discuss their fare so openly that soon one learns who and what they are. There is a venerable son of Islam who is attired in a long black silk coat which is buttoned around his neck. A round black cap, neatly embroidered and gold, rest on his thinly thatched head. White pajama trousers are gathered around his legs, while his shoes provide an artistic finish to his dress, for they are daintily made with red and green threadwork. There is a beetle, browed Maradi, from western India, a gold turban Marwari, who, like many members of his race, is a money lender, and a stout Brahmin lawyer from the south. They are all men of some wealth, for they are attended by personal servants who dart out of their third-class carriages at most stopping places to inquire after their master's welfare. The Mohammedan gives me a single glance, closes his eyes, and drifts off into vacuous sleep. The Marathi busies himself in conversation with the Marwari. The Brahmin has recently entered the train. He has yet to settle down. I am in one of my talkative moods, but there is no one whom I can talk with. The invisible barrier between West and East seems to divide me from all the others. I feel cheered, therefore, when the Rubicon Brahmin pulls out a book whose English title, Life of Ramakrishna, I cannot help seeing. So boldly is it printed upon the cover. I seize the bait and bring him into conversation. Has not someone once told me that Ramakrishna was the last of the Rishis? those spiritual supermen. Upon this point I engage my fellow traveler, and he is eager to respond. We ascend the heights of philosophical discussion and descend into talk on the homelier aspects of Indian life. Whenever he mentions the name of the Rishi, his voice fills with love and awe, and his eyes light up. The reality of his devotion to this long-past man is indubitable. Within two hours I learn that the Brahmin has a master who is one of the two or three surviving disciples of the great Ramakrishna himself. This master of his is nearly eighty years old and lives not in some lonely retreat, but in the heart of Calcutta's Indian quarter. Of course I beg for the address and it is freely given. You'll need no introduction other than your own desire to see him, says the lawyer. And so I am now in Calcutta itself searching for the house of the master Mahasaya, the aged disciple of Ramakrishna. Passing through an open courtyard which adjoins the street, I reach a steep flight of steps leading into a large, rambling old house. I climb up a dark stairway and pass through a low door on the top story. I find myself in a small room which opens out onto the flat terraced roof of the house. Two of its walls are lined with low divans, Save for the lamp and a small pile of books and papers, the room is otherwise bare. A young man enters and bids me wait for the coming of his master, who is on a lower floor. Ten minutes pass. I hear the sound of someone stirring from a room on the floor below out into the stairway. Immediately there is a tingling sensation in my head, and the idea suddenly grips me that that man downstairs has fixed his thoughts upon me. I hear the man's footsteps going up the stairs. When at last, for he moves with extreme slowness, he enters the room. I need no one to announce his name. A venerable patriarch has stepped from the pages of the Bible, and a figure from Mosaic times has turned to flesh. This man, with bald head, long white beard, and white mustache, grave countenance, and large reflective eyes, 
This man, whose shoulders are slightly bent with the burden of nearly eighty years of mundane existence, can be none other than the Master Mahasaya. He takes his seat on a divan and then turns his face towards mine. In that grave, sober presence, I realized instantly that there can be no light persiflage, no banding of wit or humor, no utterance even of the harsh cynicism and dark skepticism which overshadow my soul from time to time. His character, with its commingling of perfect faith in God and nobility of conduct, is written in his appearance for all to see. He addresses me in perfectly accented English. You are welcome here. He bids me come closer and take my seat on the same divan. He holds my hand for a few moments. I deem it expedient to introduce myself and explain the object of my visit. When I have concluded speaking, he presses my hand again in a kindly manner and says, It is a higher power which has stirred you to come to India, and which is bringing you in contact with the holy men of our land. There is a real purpose behind that, and the future will surely reveal it. Await it patiently. Will you tell me something about your master, Ramakrishna? Ah, now you raise a subject about which I love best to talk. It is nearly half a century since he left us, but his blessed memory can never leave me. Always it remains fresh and fragrant in my heart. I was twenty-seven when I met him and was constantly in his society for the last five years of his life. The result was that I became a changed man. My whole attitude towards life was reversed. Such was the strange influence of this god-man Ramakrishna. He threw a spiritual spell upon all who visited him. He literally charmed them, fascinated them. Even materialistic persons who came to scoff became dumb in his presence. But how can such persons feel reverence for spirituality, a quality in which they do not believe? I interposed, slightly puzzled. The corners of Mahasaya's mouth pull up in a half-smile. He answers, Two persons taste red pepper. One does not know its name. Perhaps he has never even seen it before. The other is well acquainted with it and recognizes it immediately. Will it not taste the same to both? Will not both of them have a burning sensation on the tongue? In the same way, ignorance of Ramakrishna's spiritual greatness did not debar materialistic persons from tasting the radiant influence of spirituality which emanated from him. Then he really was a spiritual superman. Yes, and in my belief, even more than that, Ramakrishna was a simple man, illiterate and uneducated. He was so illiterate that he could not even sign his name, let alone write a letter. He was humble in appearance and humbler still in mode of living. Yet he commanded the allegiance of some of the best educated and most cultured men of the time in India. They had to bow before his tremendous spirituality which was so real that it could be felt. He taught us that pride, riches, wealth, worldly honors, worldly position are trivialities in comparison with that spirituality, are fleeting illusions which deceive men. Ah, those were wonderful days. Often he would pass into trances of so palpably divine a nature that we who were gathered around him then would feel that he was a god rather than a man. Strangely, too, he possessed the power of inducing a similar state in his disciples by means of a single touch. In this state, they could understand the deep mysteries of God by means of direct perception. But let me tell you how he affected me. I had been educated along Western lines. My head was filled with intellectual pride. I had served in Calcutta colleges as professor of English literature history and political economy. At different times, Ramakrishna was living in the temple of Dakshineswar, which is only a few miles up the river from Calcutta. There I found him one unforgettable spring day and listened to his simple expression of spiritual ideas born of his own experience. I made a feeble attempt to argue with him, but soon became tongue-tied in that sacred presence whose effect on me was too deep for words. Again and again I visited him, unable to stay away from this poor, humble, but divine person 
until Ramakrishna one day humorously remarked, a peacock was given a dose of opium at four o'clock. The next day it appeared again, exactly at that hour. It was under the spell of opium and came for another dose. That was true, symbolically speaking. I had never enjoyed such blissful experiences as when I was in the presence of Ramakrishna. So you can wonder why I came again and again. And so I became one of his group of intimate disciples, as distinguished from merely occasional visitors. One day the master said to me, I can see from the signs of your eyes, brow and face that you are a yogi. Do all your work then, but keep your mind on God. Wife, children, father and mother, live with all and serve them as if they are your own. The tortoise swims about in the waters of the lake, but her mind is fixed to where her eggs are laid on the banks. So do all the work of the world, but keep the mind in God. And so, after the passing away of our master, when most of the other disciples voluntarily renounced the world, adopted the yellow robe, and trained themselves to spread Ramakrishna's message through India, I did not give up my profession, but carried on with my work and education. Nevertheless, such was my determination not to be of the world, although I was in it, that on some nights I would retire at dead of night to the open veranda before the Senate House, and sleep among the homeless beggars of the city, who usually collected there to spend the night. This used to make me feel, temporarily at least, that I was a man with no possessions. Ramakrishna has gone, but as you travel through India you will see something of the social, philanthropic, medical, and educational work being done throughout the country, under the inspiration of those early disciples of his, most of whom, alas, have now passed away too. What you will not see so easily is the number of changed hearts and changed lives primarily due to this wonderful man, for his message has been handed down from disciple to disciple, who have spread it so widely as they could, and I have been privileged to take down many of his sayings in Bengali. The published record has entered almost every household in Bengal while translations have also gone into other parts of India. So you see how Ramakrishna's influence has spread far beyond the immediate circle of his little group of disciples. Mahasaya finishes his long recital and relapses into silence. As I look at his face anew, I am struck by the non-Hindu color and cast of his face. Again, I am wafted back to a little kingdom in Asia Minor, where the children of Israel find a temporary respite from their hard fortunes. I picture Mahasaya among them as a venerable prophet speaking to his people. How noble and dignified the man looks. His goodness, honesty, virtue, piety, and sincerity are transparent. He possesses that self-respect of a man who has lived a long life in utter obedience to the voice of conscience. I wonder what Ramakrishna would say to a man who cannot live by faith alone who must satisfy reason and intellect, I murmur questioningly. He would tell the man to pray. Prayer is a tremendous force. Ramakrishna himself prayed to God to send him spiritually inclined people, and soon after those who later became his disciples or devotees began to appear. But if one has never prayed, what then? Prayer is the last resort. It is the ultimate resource left to man. Prayer will help a man where the intellect may fail. But if someone came to you and said that prayer did not appeal to his temperament, what counsel would you give him? I persist gently. Then let him associate frequently with the holy men who have had real spiritual experience. Constant contact with them will assist him to bring out his latent spirituality. Higher men turn our minds and wills towards divine objects. Above all, they stimulate an intense longing for the spiritual life. Therefore, the society of such men is very important as the first step and often is also the last, as Ramakrishna himself used to say. Thus we discourse on things high and holy, and how man can find no peace save in the eternal good. Throughout the evening, different visitors make their arrival until the modest room is packed with Indians, disciples of the Master Mahasaya. They come nightly and climb the stairs of this four-storied house to listen intently to every word uttered by their teacher. 
and for a while I too join them. Night after night I come, less to hear the pious utterances of Mahasaya than to bask in the spiritual sunshine of his presence. The atmosphere around him is tender and beautiful, gentle and loving. He has found some inner bliss in the radiation of it seems palpable. Often I forget his words, but I cannot forget his benignant personality. That which drew him again and again to Ramakrishna seems to draw me to Mahasaya also, and I begin to understand how potent must have been the influence of the teacher when the pupil exercises such a fascination upon me. When our last evening comes, I forget the passage of time, as I sit happily at his side upon the divan. Hour after hour has flown by. Our talk has had no interlude of silence, but at length it comes. And then the good master takes my hand and leads me out to the terraced roof of his house, where in the vivid moonlight I see a circling array of tall plants growing in pots and tubs. Down below a thousand lights gleam from the houses of Calcutta. The moon is at its full. Mahasaya points towards its round face and then pauses into silent prayer for a brief while. I wait patiently at his side until he finishes. He turns, raises his hand in benediction and lightly touches my head. I bow humbly before this angelic man, unreligious though I am. After a few more moments of continued silence, he says softly, My task has almost come to an end. This body has nearly finished what God sent it here to do. Accept my blessing before I go. He has strangely stirred me. I banished the thought of sleep and wandered through many streets. When at length I reach a great mosque and hear the solemn chant, God is most great, break forth upon the midnight stillness, I reflect that if anyone could free me from the intellectual skepticism to which I cling and attach me to a life of simple faith, it is undoubtedly the Master Mahasaya. Before long, I was apprised of his death. You have missed him. Perhaps it was destined that you should not meet. Who can tell? The speaker is Dr. Banyu Padya, house surgeon to one of the Calcutta hospitals. He is one of the most skillful surgeons in the city. His hands have performed 6,000 operations. His name possesses a string of degrees trailing after it, and I have derived much pleasure in carefully and critically examining with him some of the knowledge of the yoga of body control, which I have picked up. His scientific training in medicine and his expert knowledge of anatomy have proved helpful in my endeavor to lift the subject of yoga to a purely rational plane. I know almost nothing of yoga, he has confessed. What you tell me is new to me. I have not even met a yogi that is a real one, save Nidishanga Swami, who came to Calcutta not long ago. It is then that I inquire about the latter's whereabouts only to receive this disappointing answer. Nasaringa Swami flashed into Calcutta, created a sensation, and then went off I know not where. I understood that he emerged suddenly out of retirement in the interior before he came here, so he may have returned there. I would like to know what happened. He was the talk of the town for a short time. He was discovered by Dr. Nioji, who is professor of chemistry at the Presidency College of Calcutta University, a month or two before at Madhupore. Dr. Neoji saw him lick a few drops of poisonous acid and also stuff glowing charcoal in his mouth and keep it there until it stopped glowing. The doctor's interest was aroused and the yogi was persuaded to come to Calcutta. The university arranged to have a public demonstration of Narisinga Swami's powers before an audience composed exclusively of scientists and medical men. I was among those invited to be present. It was held in the physics theater of the Presidency College. We were a fairly critical lot, as you know. I have given very little thought to matters of religion, yoga, and such like things because my attention has been centered on professional studies. The yogi stood in the center of the theater and he was handed poisons which had been taken from the college laboratory stock. We gave him a bottle of sulfuric acid first. He poured a few drops into his palm and licked them up with his tongue. He was then given strong carbolic acid and he licked that up too. We tried him with that deadly poison potassium cyanide, but he swallowed it without turning a hair. The feat was astounding, unbelievable even. 
yet we had to accept the evidence of our own eyes. He had taken enough potassium cyanide to kill any other man within three minutes at most, yet there he stood, smiling and apparently unharmed. After that, a thick glass bottle was broken and the pieces were ground down to a powder. Not a single swami swallowed the powder, which can slowly kill. Three hours after swallowing this strange meal, one of our Calcutta doctors applied a stomach pump to the yogi and the contents of his stomach were taken out. The poisons were still there, and on the following day the powdered glass was discovered in his stool. The thoroughness of our test was beyond dispute. The strength of the sulfuric acid was shown by its destructive effect on a copper coin. Among those present at the demonstration was Sir C. V. Raman, the famous scientist and winner of the Nobel Prize, who described the performance as a challenge to modern science. When we asked Narasinga Swami how he was able to take such liberties with his body, he told us that immediately on his return home he would go into a yoga trance and, by an intense concentration of the mind, counteract the deadly effect of the poisons. Can you offer any explanation based on your medical knowledge? The doctor shakes his head. No, I can offer none. It completely baffles me. When I return home, I hunt through a trunk for the notebook in which I have recorded my conversations with Brahma, the yogi of the Adyar River. I turn the pages rapidly until I find this note. Poisons cannot harm the adept who has practiced the grand exercise, no matter how violent they may be. This exercise is a combination of certain posture, breathing, willpower, and mind concentration exercises. According to our tradition, it confers upon the adept the power of absorbing any object he chooses, even poisons, without being inconvenienced. It is an exceedingly difficult practice and must be regularly done if it is to keep its merit. A very old man once told me of a yogi who lived in Benares and who could drink large quantities of poison without being harmed. This yogi's name was Trelingya Swami. He was very well known in the town in those days, but he died many years ago. Jailinga was a great adept who was very learned in the yoga of body control. He sat almost clothless on the banks of the Ganges for years, but no one could hold converse with him because he had imposed a vow of silence upon himself. Incredible and impossible, I had deemed this immunity to poison, when Brahma had brought the subject within the line of my vision for the first time. But now... My preconceived ideas of the limits of what is possible have become a little shaky. Sometimes I have wondered at the unbelievable and almost incomprehensible task which these yogis set themselves. Yet who knows? Perhaps they possess secrets which we Westerners are vainly trying to discover through a thousand laboratory experiments. Chapter 11 The Wonder Worker of Benares my wanderings in Bengal must hasten into the limbo of unrecorded experience, and my unexpected contacts near Buddha Gaya with three Tibetan lamas, who proffer an invitation to their mountain monastery, must likewise follow suit, for I am eager to enter the sacred city of Benares. The train thunders across the great iron bridge near the city, its noise heralding, no doubt, modernity's further invasion of an antiquated and static form of society. The holy Ganges can hardly remain holy much longer when alien and infidel men send snorting fire chariots across its grayish-green waters. So this is Benares. A huge crowd of pilgrims jostle each other while I pass out of the station and step into a waiting carriage. As we drive along the dusty road, I become aware of a new element in the atmosphere. I try to ignore it, but with increasing insistence, it forces itself upon my attention. So this is India's holiest city. Well, it possesses a most unholy smell. Benares is reputed to be the oldest populated town in India. Its odor fully confirms its reputation. The unsavory air seems insupportable. I begin to lose courage. Shall I order the driver to take me back to the station? Is it not better to be an errant infidel and breathe clean air than acquire piety at such a monstrous price? And then I reflect that time will somehow acclimatize one even to this air, 
as it acclimatizes one to more unfamiliar things still in this stale land. But Benares, you may be the hub of Hindu culture, yet please learn something from the infidel whites and temper your holiness with a little hygiene. I learned that the stench arises partly because the roads are paved with a mixture of cow dung and earth, and partly because the old moat which surrounds the city has been used by the people of many generations as a convenient refuse heap. If Indian chronicles can be credited, Benares was an established city as long ago as 1,200 years before the Christian era. Just as pious Englishmen journeyed to the holy city of Canterbury in the Middle Ages, so of Indians flocked from every part of their country to the holy city of Benares. Hindus come in their wealthy state or poverty-stricken condition to receive its blessing, while the healing come to eke out their last days, for death here will take the soul straight into paradise. The next day I wander afoot through old Kashi, as the Hindus prefer to call their city, and explore their labyrinth of crooked streets which compose it. There is a purpose behind my aimless wandering, for I bear in my pocket a paper which describes the location of the house of a yogi wonder worker whose disciple I met in Bombay. I pass through stuffy streets, along which a carriage would be too wide to pass. I make my way through crowded bazaars, where seethe the people of a dozen different races, and where mangy dogs and innumerable flies add to the bustle. Old women with gray hair and shrunken breasts, young women with supple figures and smooth brown limbs, pilgrims fingering their rosaries, and muttering the same sacred words which they have already repeated perhaps fifty thousand times. The gaunt figures of ash-besmeared elderly ascetics, all these and other types throng the narrow ways. Among a tangle of streets which are full of turmoil, noise, and color, I come accidentally upon the golden temple which is famed among the Orthodox throughout India. Espidabbed ascetics, whose uncouth appearance is repellent to Western eyes, crouch around the entrance. Worshippers flow in and out in an endless stream. Several carry lovely flower garlands and thus give a gay color to the scene. The pious touch the stone door post with their foreheads as they leave the temple, and then turning start in momentary surprise on beholding the white infidel. I become conscious again of the invisible barrier between these men and myself, the profound barrier between white and brown skin. Two domes, made of thick sheets of gold, glisten in the quivering sunlight. Screeching parrots swarm on the nearest tower. The golden temple is given over to the god Shiva. Where is he now, I wonder, this god to whom these Hindus cry, before whom they pray and to whose stone representations I have seen them offer scented flowers and cooked rice? I move on and stand near the threshold of another temple, where I watch the god Krishna being worshipped. Lighted camphor burns before a golden idol. The temple bells peel out their insistent calls for his attention, and the sounds of conch horns stray up to his unhearing ears. A lean and austere priest comes out and looks questioningly at me, and I proceed upon my way. Who can count the multitude of images and idols which teem within the temples and houses of Benares? Who can explain these serious-looking Hindus, so often childish, yet sometimes so profoundly philosophical? Through the dark alleys I thread my way, afoot and alone, seeking the house of the Wonder Worker. At length I emerge from the swarming streets into wider roads. A straggling, ragged column of little boys Thin youths and a few men swing past me in single file. Their leader carries a makeshift banner with something indecipherable inscribed upon the flag. They shout queer catchwords and occasional snatches of song. They look at me with hostile faces and scowling eyes as they go by, so that I sense the political nature of this motley procession. Last night, in a packed bazaar, with no European or policeman anywhere in sight, Someone behind me hisses out a threat to shoot me. At once I wheel round, only to behold a crowd of bland faces, for the young fanatic, I guess his youth, by the sound of his voice, has disappeared around a corner into the darkness. And so I gaze with pity upon this ragged procession, which now disappears down the road. 
politics. That deceptive siren who promises everybody everything has gathered a few more victims enter in city's arms. I come at last to a street where the houses are large and well-built and where the compounds are spacious and trimly kept. I quicken my pace until I reach a gate upon whose post the name Vishu Dananda is inscribed on a stone tablet. I enter the compound, for this is the house which I seek, and approach someone who lounges on the veranda. He is a young man with an unintelligent face. I ask him in Hindustani, where's the teacher? But he shakes his head and gives me to understand that no such person is known here. I utter the teacher's name, but again receive a negative reply. The result is disappointing, but I am determined not to be beaten. An inward monitor warns me that the young man thinks no European can possibly have any business here and that he has jumped to the conclusion I am really seeking some other house. I look again at his face and write him down as stupid. Ignoring his gesticulations, I walk straight into the house. In an inner room, I come upon a semicircle of dark faces. A group of well-dressed Indians squat around the floor. A bearded old man reclines upon a couch at the far end of the room. His venerable appearance and seat of honor are enough to inform me that here is the object of my quest. I raise my hands in salutation, palms touching. Peace, master. I make the conventional Hindustani greeting. I proffer my introduction and present myself as a writer traveling in India, yet withal a student of their native philosophy and mysticism. I make it clear that the disciple whom I encountered was careful to explain that his teacher never made a public exhibition of his wonderful powers, and that even under the shadow of privacy he rarely displayed them to strangers. Nevertheless, in view of my deep interest and their ancient wisdom, I crave their indulgence and beg to be treated as an exception. The students stare blankly at each other and then turn towards the teacher as if in wonderment at his response. Vishu Dananda is a man of more than seventy years of age, I judge. A short nose and a long beard adorn his face. I am struck by the large size of his eyes, which are deeply pouched. The sacred thread of a Brahmin hangs around his neck. The old man fixes his eyes coldly upon me as though I were a specimen to be studied under a microscope. I feel something weird and uncanny touch my heart. Indeed, some strange force seems to pervade the whole room, and I feel slightly uneasy. At length he addresses some words in a dialect which I recognize as Bengali to a disciple who turns and informs me that no audience can be granted unless I bring Pundit Kavrij, who is principal of the government Sanskrit college, to act as interpreter. The Pundit's perfect knowledge of English, combined with his long standing as a disciple of Vishuddhananda, perfectly fits him to act as a medium between us. Come with him tomorrow afternoon, says the teacher. I shall expect you at the hour of four. I am forced to retreat. On the road I hail a passing carriage and drive through the winding streets to the Sanskrit college. The principal is not there. Someone thinks he may be at home, so I drive on for another half hour until I find him at last in a tall ancient house with a projecting upper story, whose appearance is strangely like that of a medieval Italian building. The pundit sits on the floor of a top room, surrounded on every side by small hills of books, papers, and scholastic paraphernalia. He has the Brahmin's typical high brow, thin long nose, and lighter complexion. His face is refined and scholarly. I explain my errand. There is a slight hesitation on his part. And then he agrees to accompany me next day. The appointment fixed, I withdraw. I ride down to the Ganges and dismiss the carriage. I saunter along the river bank, which, for the benefit of bathing pilgrims, is built into long rows of stone steps. The feet of many centuries have worn down the steps until they are rugged and uneven. How untidy and irregular is the waterfront of Benares! Temples tumble into the water. Glistening domes are neighbors to squat, square, decorated palaces, which rise to varying heights while the whole hotchpotch of buildings mingles the ancient and the modern indiscriminately. Priests and pilgrims swarm everywhere. 
I come across some pundits teaching their pupils in small open rooms. The walls are plainly whitewashed, the teachers sit on rugs, and the pupils squat respectfully around, absorbing the cobweb doctrines of their creed. A bearded ascetic's appearance causes me to make inquiries. He has rolled over and over in the dust for four hundred miles, a strange way to make one's pilgrimage to Benares. Farther on I meet another weird-looking individual. He has held one arm aloft for years. The sinews and ligaments of his unfortunate limb have almost withered, while the flesh which covers it has shriveled to parchment. How account for such feudal austerities, unless indeed the unending tropical sun has made the minds of these men a trifle mad? It may be that existence in a temperature of 120 degrees in the shade has helped to unbalance these unfortunate members of a race which is already so prone to religious hysteria. The next day, precisely at four o'clock, Pandit Kavrij and I drive into the courtyard of the teacher's house. We enter the large room and greet him. About six other disciples are present. Vishu Dinanda asked me to come a little closer so I squat down a few feet away from his couch. Do you desire to see one of my wonders? is his first question. If the master wishes to grant this favor, I shall be extremely pleased. Give me your handkerchief, then. If you have a silk one, so much the better, translates the pundit. Any scent which you desire will be created for you, with nothing but a lens and the sun's rays as equipment. Fortunately, I do carry a silk handkerchief and pass it to the wonder worker. He takes out a small burning lens and then explains that he wishes to concentrate the sun's rays, but owing to the orb's present position and the sheltered aspect of the room, that cannot be done with directness. The difficulty will easily be overcome, however, by sending one of the disciples outside into the courtyard. The man will use a hand mirror, catch the rays, and then reflect them through an open window into the room. I shall now create a scent for you out of the air, announces Vishuddhananda. Which would you like? Can you produce white jasmine? He takes up my handkerchief in his left hand and holds the burning lens above it. For the brief space of two seconds, a gleaming ray of sunlight hovers upon the silken fabric. Then he puts down the lens and hands back the handkerchief. I put it to my nose and am rewarded with the delightful fragrance of white jasmine. I examine the handkerchief, but can discover no trace of moisture, no evidence that some liquid perfume has been dropped on it. I am puzzled, and look half suspiciously at the old man. He offers to repeat the demonstration. The second time I choose a tar of roses. I watch him narrowly during the further experiment. Every move which he makes, every bit of space around him, is scrutinized with all the care I can muster. I examine his puffy hands and his spotless white robe with critical eyes, but can detect nothing suspicious. He repeats his former procedure and evokes the perfume of a tar of roses, which strongly impregnates another corner of the handkerchief. My third choice is violets. Here again he is equally successful. Vishu Dananda is quite emotionless about his triumph. He treats the whole demonstration as a sort of everyday affair, as a mere minor event. His grave face never once relaxes. And now I shall choose the scent, he unexpectedly declares. I shall create the perfume of a flower which grows only in Tibet. He concentrates some sunlight upon the last unscented corner of the handkerchief, and lo, it is done. He has evoked a fourth perfume which I failed to recognize. Slightly bewildered, I put the piece of white silk into my pocket. The feet appears to border on the miraculous. Has he concealed the perfumes upon his person? Has he hidden them in his robe? Then he would need to carry a formidable stock, because until I spoke he could not know which scent I should choose. His simple robe could hardly contain such an ample stock as would be requisite. Besides, not once has his hand disappeared into the folds of his robe. I ask for permission to inspect the lens. The latter proves to be quite an ordinary magnifying glass, set in a wire frame with a small wire handle. I can see nothing suspicious about it. There is an additional safeguard for what it is worth in the fact that Vishuddhananda is being watched not only by me, 
but also by the half-dozen disciples around us. The pundit has already informed me that without a single exception, they are all men of high standing, good education, and responsibility. Hypnotism offers a possible explanation. The value of this explanation can be simply tested. When I return to my quarters, I shall show the handkerchief to other persons. Vishu Danana has another and great piece of wonder working to show me. It is one he seldom performs, though. He tells me that he needs strong sunlight for the second feet. Now the sun is sinking and evening is approaching, so I am to come again at high noon at a later day of the week. He will then display his amazing feat of temporarily restoring life to the dead. I leave him and drive home, where I show the handkerchief to three persons. Each one finds that it still bears strong traces of the perfumes. The feet, therefore, cannot be accounted for on the hypothesis of hypnotism. Nor is it much easier to regard the whole affair as a piece of trickery. Once again, I am in the house of the magician. The latter tells me that he can restore life only to a small animal. Usually he experiments with a bird. A sparrow is strangled and left exposed to our gaze for about an hour, so that we can assure ourselves that it is really dead. Its eyes are motionless, its body sad and stiff. I cannot discover a single sign which might betray the presence of life in the little creature. The magician picks up his magnifying glass and concentrates a ray of sunlight into an eye of the bird. I wait while a few minutes pass uneventfully. The old man sits bent over his strange task, his large eyes fixed in a glassy stare, his face cold, emotionless, and noncommittal. Suddenly his lips open and his voice breaks out into a weird, crooning chant in some language which is unknown to me. A little later the bird's body begins to twitch. I have seen a dog twitch its suffering frame in the same manner when the spasms of approaching death have overtaken it. Then comes a slight fluttering of the feathers, and within a few minutes the sparrow is on its legs, hopping around the floor. Truly the dead have come to life. During its next phase of this strange existence, the bird gathers sufficient strength to fly up into the air, where it busies itself for a while in finding new perching points as it flies around the room. The thing seems so incredible that I pull my body and wits together in an effort to reassure myself that everything and everyone surrounding me is real, tangible, and not hallucinatory. A tense half-hour passes while I watch the fluttering efforts of the revived creature. At last, a sudden climax provides me with a fresh surprise. The poor sparrow falls through the air and lies motionless at our feet. It remains there without stirring. An examination reveals it as breathless and quite dead. Could you have prolonged its life still further? I ask the magician. That is the most I can show you at present, he replies with a slight shrug. The pundit whispers that greater things are hoped for from future experiments. There are other things his master can do, though I must not overuse his indulgence and make him play the part of a street showman. What I have seen already must satisfy me. I feel once again the pervading sense of mystery which fills the place. The stories of Vishu Dananda's other powers only heighten this feeling. I learn that he can bring fresh grapes seemingly out of the air and deliver sweetmeats out of sheer nothingness. That if he takes a faded flower in his hand, it will soon regain its pristine freshness. What is the secret of these apparent miracles? I try to elicit some hint and receive an extraordinary reply. It is one of those explanations which do not really explain. The real secret still remains hidden behind the square forehead of the Benari's wonder worker, and he has so far not revealed it even to his closest disciple. He tells me that his birthplace was in Bengal. At the age of 13, he was bitten by a poisonous animal. His condition became so serious that his mother despaired of his life and took him down to the Ganges to die. According to the Hindu religion, there can be no holier or happier death than beside this river. He was carried into the sacred stream while the mourning family gathered on the banks for the funeral ceremonies. He was lowered into the water, and then a miracle happened. The deeper they dipped him, the more the water sank around his body. When he was raised again, the water rose upward in harmony until it reached its normal level. Again and again he was dipped. 
again and again the waters sank of their own accord. In short, the Ganges refused to receive the boy as its dying guest. A yogi sat on the banks of the river and watched the proceedings. He got up and predicted that the boy was reserved to live and achieve greatness, and that his destiny was most fortunate inasmuch as he would become a famous yogi. The man then rubbed some herbs on the poisoned wound and went away. Seven days later, he returned and told the parents that the boy was now quite cured, and indeed it was so. But during the interim, a strange thing had happened to the child. His entire mentality and character had changed, and instead of being content to remain at home with his parents, he thirsted to become a wandering yogi. Henceforth, he worried his mother constantly until, a few years later, she granted him permission to leave home. He went forth in quest of the yoga adepts. He made his way to Tibet, that trans Himalayan land of mystery, in the hope of finding his destined teacher among its reputed miracle working hermits. For it is an idea strongly inherent in the Indian mind that the aspirant must become a personal disciple of someone who has himself mastered the mysteries of yoga if he is to succeed in the same quest. The young Bengali sought for such a man among the solitary hermits who dwell in huts or caves, sometimes when the mountains were swept by howling, icy blizzards, but he returned home disappointed. Years passed uneventfully, yet his desire found no abatement. Once more, he crossed the border and wandered the bleak waste of southern Tibet. In a simple habitation among the mountain fastnesses, he discovered a man who proved to be the long-sought teacher. I hear next one of those incredible statements which might once have moved me to satiric laughter, but now actually startles me, for I am solemnly assured that this Tibetan master is no less than 1,200 years old. The assertion is made as calmly as a prosaic Westerner might mention that he is 40. The amazing legend of longevity has cropped up at least twice before. Brahma the yogi of the Adyar River once told me that his master in Nepal was over 400 years old, while a holy man whom I encountered in western India said that there was a yogi living in an almost inaccessible mountain cave in the Himalayas who was so old, over 1,000 years, was the figure given me that the lids of his eyes actually drooped heavily with age. I had dismissed both these assertions as being too fantastic. But now I must again entertain a repetition of them, for this man before me hints at being on the track of the elixir of life. The Tibetan teacher initiated young Vishuddhananda into the principles and practices of the yoga of body control. Under this rigorous training, the disciple developed powers of body and mind which were supernormal. He was also initiated into a strange art which he calls solar science. For twelve years, despite the hardships of life in a snowbound region, he continued his pupillage at the feet of the Tibetan possessor of immortal life. His training finished, he was sent back to India. He crossed the mountain passes, descended into the plains, and in due course himself became a teacher of yoga. He settled for a while at Puri on the Bay of Bengal, where he still maintains a large bungalow. The flock of disciples which gathered around him belong exclusively to the higher class of Hindus. They comprise wealthy merchants, rich landowners, government officials, and even a Raja. I get the impression, perhaps I am wrong, that humbler folk are not encouraged. How do you perform these wonders you showed me? I asked bluntly. Vishuddhananda crosses his plump hands. What you have been shown is not the result of yoga practice. It is the result of a knowledge of solar science. The essence of yoga is the development of willpower and mental concentration on the part of the yogi. But in solar science practice, those qualities are not required. Solar science is merely a collection of secrets, and no special training is necessary to make use of them. It can be studied in exactly the same way that any of your Western material sciences are studied. Pandit Kavir supplements the hint that this strange art is more akin to the science of electricity and magnetism than to any other. I feel as much in the dark as before, so the master vouchsafes some further information. This solar science, which now comes from Tibet, is nothing new. 
It was well known to the great yogis of India in very ancient times. But now, except for a rare few, it has almost been lost to this country. There are life-giving elements in the sun's rays, and if you knew the secret of separating or selecting those elements, you too could do wonders. Then there are etheric forces in sunlight which have a magic power once you get control of them. Are you teaching these solar science secrets to your disciples? Not yet, but I am preparing to do so. Certain disciples will be selected and the secrets imparted to them. Even now we are building a large laboratory where study classes, demonstrations, and experiments will be carried on. Then what are your disciples learning at present? They are being initiated into yoga. The pundit takes me to inspect the laboratory. It is a modern structure, several stories high and distinctly European in design. The walls are built of red brick and large gaps take the place of windows. These gaps await the coming of huge sheets of plate glass. For the research work to be conducted in the laboratory will involve the reflection of sunlight through red, blue, green, yellow, and colorless glass. The pundit tells me that no Indian works can make glass of the size required to form the giant windows and therefore the edifice cannot be completed. He asked me to make inquiries in England, but emphasizes that Vishu Dhananda wants his specifications to be adhered to completely. These include the condition that the makers should guarantee their glass to be absolutely free from air bubbles, and that the colored glass should be quite transparent. Each sheet is to measure 12 feet high, 8 feet in width, and 1 inch in thickness. The laboratory building is surrounded by spacious gardens, which are girdled and screened from prying eyes by rows of feather-branched palm trees. I return to the wonder worker and sit down before him. The disciples have thinned out. Only two or three are left. Pandit Kavirish squats beside me, his study-worn face fixed in devoted regard of his master. Vishudananda momentarily glances at me and then studies the floor. Dignity and reserve mingle in his manner. His face is preternaturally solemn, and the faces of his disciples reflect his solemnity. I attempt to penetrate behind his mask of gravity, but can perceive nothing. The mind of this man is as impenetrable to my Western mentality as is the inmost shrine of the golden temple in yonder town. He is steeped in the strange lore of oriental magic. I feel strongly that though he has shown me his wonders even before I express a second request, nevertheless he has put up a psychic barrier between us, which I shall never cross. My welcome is but a surface one. Western investigators and Western disciples are not wanted here. He drops an unexpected remark quite suddenly. I could not initiate you as my own pupil unless I secure permission beforehand from my Tibetan master. This is a condition under which I have to work. As he read the thoughts which run through my brain, I gaze at him. His slightly bulging forehead betrays a faint pucker. Anyway, I have expressed no desire to become his disciple. I am in no undue hurry to become anyone's disciple. But one thing I feel sure, such a request would bring forth a negative answer. But how can you communicate with your master if he is in far off Tibet? I query. We are in perfect touch upon the inner planes, he replies. I am conscious of listening, but not of comprehending. Yet his unexpected remark has turned my mind away from his miracles for a while. I fall into a pensive mood. Unwittingly, I find myself asking, Master, how can one find enlightenment? Vishuddhananda does not reply. Instead, he puts me another question. Unless you practice yoga, how can you obtain enlightenment? I think the matter over for a few seconds. Yet I am told that without a teacher, it is extremely difficult to understand yoga, let alone practice it successfully. Genuine teachers are hard to find. His face remains indifferent and imperturbable. When the seeker is ready, the master always appears. I express my doubts. He spreads out a plump hand. A man must first make himself ready. Then, no matter where he is, he will eventually find a teacher. And if the master does not come in the flesh, he will appear to the inward eye of the seeker. How shall one begin then? 
mark off a part of your time every day to sit in the simple posture which I shall show you. That will help to prepare you. Take care also to curb anger and control passion. Vishuddhananda proceeds to show me the lotus posture, with which I am already familiar. Why he calls this a simple posture, with its intertwined and folded legs, I cannot understand. What adult European can achieve such a contortion? I exclaim. The difficulty lies only in the early attempts. It becomes easy if practiced every morning and evening. The important thing is to fix an exact time of the day for this yoga practice and to keep regularly to that time. At first, five minutes effort is enough. After one month, you can lengthen the time to ten minutes. After three months to twenty minutes, and so on. Take care to keep the spine straight. This exercise will enable a man to acquire physical poise and mental calmness. Calmness is necessary for the further practice of yoga. Then you teach the yoga of body control. Yes, do not imagine that the yoga of mind control is superior to it. Just as every human being both thinks and acts, so there must be training for both sides of our nature. The body acts on the mind, and the mind interacts on the body. They cannot be separated in practical development. I become aware once again of an inner reluctance on the part of this man to submit to further questioning. A mental coldness fills the atmosphere. I decide to withdraw soon, but fling a last question at him. Have you discovered whether there is any goal, any purpose in life? The disciples break their gravity and smile at my simplicity. Only an infidel, ignorant Westerner could ask such a question. Do not all the sacred Hindu books without exception indicate that, that God holds this world in his hand for his own purpose? The teacher does not answer me. He relapses into silence, but glances at Kavrij, who thereupon supplies the answer. Certainly there is a purpose. We have to attain spiritual perfection to unite with God. And then for the next hour, the room remains silent. Vishuddhananda fingers the large pages of a thick book whose paper cover is printed in Bengali. The disciples stare, sleep, or meditate. A soothing, mesmeric influence begins to steal over me. I feel that if I stay long enough, I shall either fall asleep or fall into some kind of a trance. So I pull my faculties together, thank the teacher, and take my departure. After a light meal, I pick my way through tortuous alleys in this motley city, which seems to attract saints and sinners alike. It lures the pious from all over the land into its crowded homes, but it also draws the impious, the ruffianly, and the vicious, to say nothing of the priestly parasites. The jingling temple bells along the bank of the Ganges peal out their call to evening worship. Night is advancing rapidly on the graying sky. Sunset adds another to its own sounds, for the musins call to the followers of the prophet to come to prayer. I sit on the bank of this ancient river, this much-revered Ganges, and listen to the rustling fronds of palms which sway slightly in the temporary breeze. An ash-besmeared beggar approaches me. He halts when I gaze at him. He is some sort of holy man, for something that is not of this world glows in his eyes. I begin to realize that I have not succeeded in understanding this old India so well as I thought. I grope among the few coins in my pocket, wondering the while whether we can leap across the abyss of civilization which separates us. He takes the alms with a quiet dignity, raises his hands to his ash-covered brow in salutation, and withdraws. I have mused for long over the mystery of the wonder-worker who plays tricks with the ether and restores bleeding life to dead birds. His plausible but brief exposition of solar science does not capture me. Only a thoughtless man would deny that modern science has not fully explored the possibilities latent in the sunlight, but there are features in this case which incline me to look elsewhere for an explanation. For in western India, I had learned of the existence of two yogis, who could perform one of Vishuddhananda's feats, namely the extraction of different scents from the air. Unfortunately for my investigation, both these persons died towards the close of the last century, but the source of my information seemed reliable enough. In both cases, a fragrant, oily essence 
was made to appear on the palm of the yogi's hand, as though it exuded through the skin. Sometimes the perfume was strong enough to scent the room. Now, if Vishuddhananda possesses the same strange gift, he can easily transfer some scent from his palm to the handkerchief, whilst appearing to fumble with the magnifying lens. In short, the whole performance of concentrating the sunlight may be nothing more than a piece of play-acting to cover the transference of the magically produced scent. Another point which favors this view is the fact that the wonder worker has failed to reveal the secret to a single one of his disciples so far. Their hopes have been kept up, meanwhile, by the protracted building of costly laboratories. Even this work has come to a standstill because of the impossibility of procuring the giant sheets of glass in India. And so they wait on and hope. What process has Vishuddhananda really used if the concentration of sunlight is merely a blind? It may be that the production of fragrant odors is another of the yogi's powers which can be developed by personal effort, but I do not know. Nevertheless, though I cannot provide a tenable theory to account for the wonder worker's feats, I need not jump at the theory of solar science which he offers. Why trouble my head further? My beauty is but to play the scribe and record these happenings not to explain the inexplicable. Here is a side of Indian life which must remain sealed, for even if a plump little wonder worker or some chosen disciple demonstrates this strange art to the outside world and engages the astounded attention of scientists, it is unlikely that the secret will be made known. I think I've read so far into his character at least. An inner voice asked me, how has he revived the dead bird, and what about this legend of a perfected yogi's ability to extend indefinitely the duration of his life? Have some eastern men really discovered the secret of protracted age? I turn my head away from the inner questioner and wearily look up at the heavens. The imponderable immensity of the star-filled sky awes me. Nowhere are the stars so bright as in the tropical sky. I continue to gaze fixedly at the twinkling points of light. When I look around again at my fellow creatures and at the amorphous mass of houses, I begin to feel deeply the recondite mystery of this world. The tangible things and ordinary objects recede quickly into unreality, and the blend of shadowy moving figures, slowly gliding boats, and a few bright lamps turn both night and environment into some enchanted land of the dream world. The old Indian philosophical doctrine that the universe is but phantom-like and its real nature drifts into my mind and begins to abet at this destruction of my sense of reality. I become ready for the strangest experiences that this planet which hurries so swiftly through the abysses of space can bring me. But some creature of the earth world breaks rudely into my heavenly dream by giving loud voice to the monotonous rhythm of an Indian song and I return rapidly to that potpourri of uncertain pleasures and unexpected sorrows which men call life.